Professor J.J. Ghosh Foundation was organized on 19th July 2012. Professor M.K. Poddar, President of the Foundation, presented their live sketch of Professor Ghosh and our aims. Dr. P.K. Shargar, INSA Senior Scientist, was the speaker of the first memorial lecture of Professor J.J. Ghosh. This is presentation of Professor Sharkar. Special Winter Program 2012, Professor Shubhasi Basu, Emeritus Professor, Notre Dame University, USA, chaired the session while Shubhasi Boshak, University of Minnesota, USA, was preparing for the talk. Dr. Shubhasi Basak, University of Minnesota, Duluth, USA, was talking on Professor Ghosh's contribution in the genesis of biomathematics in India some of the distinguished guests in the meeting. Inauguration of Professor J.J. Kosh Memorial Hall and unveiling of the bronze bust of Professor Kosh jointly by Professor Shuranjan Dash, VC of Calcutta University and Mrs. Kosh in 2013. The bronze bust and the arrangement was donated by Dr. Shankar Addo, student and admirer of Professor Kosh, now at National Cancer Institute USA, today's speaker. Professor Shuranjan Dash, VCCU, was delivering his inaugural address and Professor Tripathuti Chatiji, Professor VC, CU, Pro VC, CU, and Professor M.K. Poddar, President of the Foundation, are on the dais. Professor N.C. Mundal, INSA Fellow, Speaker of Second Memorial Lecture of Professor J.J. Ghosh, 2013. Omrita Mukherjee, winner of the prize for scoring highest marks in neurobiochemistry in MSc in Biochemistry, 2013. Special Winter Program 2013, Norindam Ray won the first prize of critical essay writing contest on possible biochemical parameters underlying meditative exercises. The topic was proposed by Professor Shapon Ghosh, USA, one of the senior students of Professor Ghosh. Lecture 2013 Winter was delivered by Dr. Milan Bhakti, Professor and Chair, Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology, University of Illinois. USA. Essay ranking competition is sponsored by him every year. Workshop on IPR in collaboration with CU, Dr. Shantanu Basu, Ekman Basu LLP, Palo Alto, California, USA, in January 2014. Third Memorial Lecture 2014, the speaker was Professor P.K. Day, ex director, Bosch Institute. Distinguished personalities in the birthday celebration 2014. Professor Bashup Chowdhury, registrar, Calcutta University, reminiscing Professor Ghosh in the birthday celebration of Professor Ghosh 2014. Professor P. K. Rao, speaker of third memorial lecture of Professor J. J. Ghosh. Professor N. C. Mondol chaired the session. Aditya Bhattacharya won prizes for, prize for highest in neurobiochemistry in MSc in biochemistry 2014. Dr. Ishwar Sharan Singh, University of Maryland School of Medicine talked on fever, inflammation, and the heat shock response 2014 winter. Lecture by Dr. Arun Dattu, National University, San Diego, USA, 2015. Fourth memorial lecture by Professor Ashish Dattu, Distinguished Scientist, 2015. Highest mark scorer in neurochemistry in MSc in biochemistry, 2015. Dr. Ashim Dattu Roy of King's Hospital, Oslo, delivered special winter session lecture in 2015. Guest in program, winter program 2015. Reminiscence of Professor, Professor Ghosh in winter program 2015. Prize winners of essay writing competition in 2015. Dr. Piju Stash delivering fifth memorial lecture on birthday celebration of Professor J.J. Ghosh 2016. Reminiscence of Professor J.J. Ghosh. Professor Shubrata Mojumdar Bosch Institute, Kolkata delivered special winter session lecture in 2016 student participants in the program. Reminiscence of Professor J.J. Ghosh. Sixth Memorial Lecture, July 2017 by Dr. Rubika Charan Banerjee, former Corporate Advisor, R&D, East India Pharmaceutical Works Limited, Kolkata. Felicitation of Dr. A.C. Banerjee. Distribution of prizes of highest marks obtained in neurobiochemistry in MS in Biochemistry 2017 and critical essay writing competition in 2016. Distribution of prizes for highest marks in neurobiochemistry and MSc in biochemistry 2017. Sorry, same. The seventh memorial lecture, July 2018, by Dr. Pratap Dash of CSIR ISCB. Can be presented by Dev Mukhopadhyay USA in the year 
in that year in winter dr devna choudhury one judge for the critical essay writing competition delivered a few words on essay competition to the competitors and then prizes were distributed dr shondip sena was another judge observation of world health day on 8th april 2019 in collaboration with society for nutrition and dietetics and villa industrial and technological museum for school students dr kunal sharkar cardiologist lectured on medicine yesterday today and tomorrow program of society for nutrition and dietetics on that day short lecture on nutritional assessment by anthropometry concept and importance for school going children arranged by snd hands on demonstration for measuring body mass index these are the posters award winning posters drawn by the school students present in the lecture of dr kunal sharkar first was sharthak dalal of delhi public school he was uh, awarded in the next program welcome address by dr shumantra das on 8th professor jj kosh memorial lecture prize distribution of poster competition held on world health day on medicine yesterday medicine yesterday today tomorrow first prize winner sharthak dalal of dps august audience of the program chairperson dr ambika charan banerjee introducing the speaker the speaker was professor dhrubajyoti chattopadhyay professor chancellor of calcutta university vice chancellor of amity university now vice chancellor of sistan dividita university he talked on the journey towards understanding for electron transport chain i think everybody can remember the days of electron transport chain of professor kush's class he was presenting the his presentation eighth memorial lecture speaker professor dhrubajyoti chattopadhyay showing the class notes of the lectures of professor jj kosh on the topic you see the yellow pages of professor jj kosh is preserved by professor dhrubajyoti chattopadhyay till today he is showing the papers on which he took the class lecture of professor jj kosh on electron transport chain felicitation of professor dhrubajyoti chattopadhyay felicitated by his phd mentor professor n c mondol who was the speaker of the second memorial lecture winter special 2019 program at lady prebon college women in science august audience speaker professor moitri dashgupta calcutta university speaker professor gauri shankar ghosh in the audience speaker dr chitra mondol says are indian institute of chemical biology now this is our contact how to contact us sir in the time of 1983 1984 with his research team then we were there myself chuvanchoda shankar das chandanda etc omit is also here now this is not the end of the journey this is just the beginning thank you thank you ma'am for your excellent presentation now i am requesting dr pranop shortkar to chair the session and to introduce our honorable guest professor shankar addo dr pranop shortkar please unmute yourself sir प्रणब दा Uh, yes yes i have unmuted yes can't see you your video is on sir oh, oh. yes our video okay yes sir your we cannot see you your video yes sir perfect sir you are right now yes yes, yes. sir yes yes okay It's a great privilege for me to introduce Dr. Shankar Addo, who is one of the one of the best students. Speak a bit louder, sir. Yes. 
can you speak a bit louder we okay. cannot hear you perfectly a bit louder sir okay your microphone maybe its volume is more down please check sir i thought you you can hear me i asked you. yes 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 okay yes sir. so are we as anybody uh, people are there said this is phd from professor jj was in 19 not 68 as uh, he did his phd in 1963 if i am correct and uh, then uh, he did another phd at the university of wisconsin in madison uh, that was in 1967 or 68 following these two phd degrees he went for his postdoctoral research is alan campbell at the university of rochester and then from rochester campbell moved to stanford university he also moved with him to stanford and about 3 4 years of postdoctoral research he came back to boss institute for about a year Currently, as a full officer, I'm not sure, but he went back and joined the National Cancer Institute as a visiting scientist in 1971. And since then, for the last 50 years, he has made great contribution in science, staying there at the National Cancer Institute, initially as a visiting scientist, then as a senior a geneticist, and finally as head of the Department of Developmental Genetics in the Laboratory of Molecular Biology at the National Cancer Institute, NIH. His 50 years of research there. He has also started teaching at the, in 1918 in 1990 at uh, George Washington University in Washington, uh, a graduate course in genetics, and he is continuing to do that till now. He is a member of many prestigious societies: American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, American Society of Genetics, Microbiology, and Virology. In 1994. he was elected member of the united states national academy of science which is very rare because only five or six indians are known to have this membership to my knowledge in 1995 he was elected a foreign fellow of our academy indian national science academy 2009 he was elected a member of the academy of arts and sciences and in 2010 hungarian academy of sciences he has many many other memberships because his cv is about 15 pages long i was forced to select the best ones out of them <laughs> because of time constraint i hope you will pleasure in 2000 in 1988 to 1993 associate editor of the journal virology for about 10 years 1977 to 1986 Between 1980 and 1995, he received several awards from NIH, and these include High Quality Performance Award in 1981, NCI Director Special Award in 1982, NCI and NIH Director Award in 1991, and NIH Merit Award in 1995. He received the Lifetime Achievement Award by American Association of Indian Scientists in 2018, and an honorary degree. of bsc from calcutta university 2006 and a lifetime achievement of honor in 2013 he also served as a member of the study section of nih and national science foundation the organization has controlled the research fund you know grant proposals are reviewed there and those are good proposals are money uh, financially supported he is a member of the tenure and promotion board of nih He was a member, 1996-2001. He had three major areas of research interest. The first one, his first lab was Galaparan. You probably know him initially, Dr. Kimberly Galmaster. So he discovered the DNA loop in the promoter region of the Galaparan. Galaparan, and DNA looping at that time was something very interesting. Nobody knew that DNA could bend. in the promoter region and it also showed that the two uh, the two promoters of the galaparan are regulated by the formation of this dna loop second interest was the biology of bacteriophage lambda in particular this the uh, decision as to whether the phage will be lytic or lysogenic who takes the decision some of the proteins takes the decision he identified the proteins and their function the role in the taking this decision whether the phage will be lytic or lysogenic 
the uh, role of the two proteins C1 and, and Pro was studied by him in details and to identify the dynamic equilibrium between the lytic and lysogenic development of the phase. Another novel, very novel, interesting areas to my mind is that he started working the application of the bacterial phase in the treatment of bacterial infections, particularly infections where, uh, which are resistant to epidemic, you know, and that's, that is therapeutic application of bacteriophages is a very recent thing and he is still continuing that, but he has created, uh, engineered new mutated bacteriophages, which are very important for therapy in bacterial infection. And his third interest was the topic which is going to talk about the folding of the, of the bacterial chromosome uh, and the three-dimensional structure that, and how this three-dimensional structure is important in the regulation of gene expression. I do not want to elaborate that because he's going to talk about it. He has patented at least five so far uh, molecules. These are mostly genetically modified bacteriophage lam lambda, genetically engineered bacteriophage lambda, which of course uh, delays their, uh, you know, inactivation inside the host. And he has also another eight patents which are pending. And I come to his publications. He has a total publications of 205. And peer uh, reviewed publications, he has four books and 35 book chapters. During the last two years only, 2019 and July 2000, he has eight publications, out of which five are related to the application of the bacteriophage in therapy, that is therapeutic application of the bacteriophages in uh, different uh, Europathogenic, uh, E. coli K12, or antibody resistance, Klebsiella. These are the two areas that he has mentioned is, uh, in his uh, biodata. And he, of course, there are many other applications that I have no time to talk about it. And the other three are related to the interaction of the proteins with the bacterial chromosome, which are involved in the formation of the three-dimensional three structure. That is the bacterial nuclear structure about which he's going to talk about. So eight publications in the last two years in very prestigious journals like PNS, Cell, Nature Communications, you know, cross genetics, etc., with an average compact factor of about 10 or so, I calculated. And this is a really is a rare accomplishment and it's a remarkable feat, I must say. Uh, he is an inspiration to all the junior chemists that we have all level. Okay. So I think with this small introduction, I will request him to begin his talk. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yes. Can I make this screen? Yes. Should I do that? I, I, I don't see the screen. Can I? We can see you. No, but the screen, the slide. Aditi, Shafna, please help. Shankuda, you have to share your, your screen. Oh, I have to do that? Yes. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm overwhelmed. I didn't expect such an elaborate introduction that um, I wished all of them were true. I doubt it now. <laughs> so it is a great honor to be here to address this. I'm sorry you had to go through all these troubles. It would have been easier for me to come and visit you, just one visit, and would have been done nicely on this Zoom and other electronic complications anyway. So let me first dedicate this talk to the memory of Dr. Jagat Jivan Bose, my mentor. I, yes, I was his, um, uh, I was his, uh, I got my PhD in 1963. I finished my work in 1962 and left 
I think I was the first PhD student awarded from his lab after he became faculty of the, uh, the uh, biochemistry department. And I think there are senior people, but he let me go and finish my PhD. And I don't know why in two years. And I asked him once, and he smiled, didn't answer. And I have a Ranjit doctor told me because he didn't, we wanted to get rid of you. That's why he get, awarded your PhD, PhD so soon. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about structure of DNA, arrangement and structure of DNA bacterial chromosome. We're talking about bacteria, Mysticia coli, and how it influences gene expression. And we believe there is a three-dimensional structure of E. coli chromosome. It's not a spaghetti um, inside the cell. And we are not there yet. We don't have a structure, but we are, I'm going to describe the approaches and methods and some results we have at the moment, just to update where we stand. And therefore, the talk will be patchy. I don't have a final conclusion, a 3D structure to show you today. So this you'll see is the first chapter of the textbook um, of the, on gene expression. You can see the DNA, which is translated to RNA by RNA polymerase, which are translated, sorry, transcribed to RNA by RNA polymerase. And then these are translated to different proteins and coded in the genes. Polymerase initiation, RNA chain initiation starts in the promoter region, which is bound by RNA polymerase, and the genes expression regulated are turned on by activators binding to the site nearby the promoter, and also depressed uh, constitutive genes are depressed by the pressure binding at the same area. Okay, we have been working on gene regulation and gene expression for decades, for decades. Uh, then only recently we realized a few years ago, only a few years ago, that our understanding of gene regulation, gene expression is not complete. We came to the realization that the DNA, DNA just is not the encode, the genetic code for protein synthesis and binding sites for RNA polymerase or transcription factors like activators and the pressures here and there. We believe this structure, the conformation of the DNA plays a strong role in properly expressing gene regulation. So that, that's the topic today. Now, so because of many evidence, we came to that conclusion and we, we made a proposal. I would not show you the, um, sorry, I screen is about it. That the chromosome of E. coli has a three-dimensional conformation that regular gene expression is that's our hypothesis, and we are collecting evidence to test that idea. So to give some introduction, the DNA, chromosomal DNA of E. coli is a circular genome, covalently closed DNA circle, which has a has 4.6 megabase pairs and is 1.5 meter long. Meter long. Like inherent polymeric property of all synthetic and natural polymers is those circular DNA becomes automatically condensed to a spherical form where the volume of the DNA is, this big E. coli DNA is 500 micrometer cube. But the look at the right, that is here, the cell volume is only 1.5 micrometer cube. This 520 cannot fit in there. It has to be further volume. There should be further volume reduction and some spatial organization to be built in, in that try to make the DNA volume 0.5 micrometer cube. And that needs enormous feet and all kinds of factors. Now, this is the picture of the textbook picture of the E. coli chromosome. If you go to a textbook, open this, and when people ice the cells and show the DS, the energies look like your noodle or spaghetti. So is this the structure of the DNA? Apparently not, I don't believe that, that's the real structure, otherwise I would not be give, giving this talk today. So it's much more organized and therefore we have to study factors that influence DNA condensation and organization to give a potential 3D structure to 
into a very small cellular volume. The three factor, major factors that influence chromosome condensation, one is the intrinsic property I told you that polymers follow, and the second is the topological properties of the circular DNA that um, is dealt by DNA apoisomerases, many of you know that, and I'm going to show only one slide about that property. We'll spend most of our time dealing with the two other factors. One is the protein, the major chromosome associated histone like protein called HU, and also recently you have discovered some non-coding RNA, small RNA, about 100 nucleotides long, uh, which are associated with the E. coli chromosome. These are, are not never translated, and they also participate, I'll have some evidence to show that they are involved in chromosome condensation and structural arrangement. This is, as you all know, the uh, textbook. I stole the slide from a textbook. There is a, on the left is shown a the uh, circular piece of DNA, sample DNA, which is 200 base pair long, which is the last DNA. In the middle, B is shown the when you reduce the linking number by opening up the helix and unwind one. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. So, in the middle is shown the negatively supercoil circle with a one hill negative superhelical turn. On this uh, right, under C, shows the positive supercoil circle because he added one twist and turn. Now, Inside the cell, in E. coli cell, most of the chromosomal DNA is mostly super well, not relaxed, that's some relaxed region. Next slide shows our results. Now the top is, I have these pictures bothering my screen. <laughs> I don't know how to turn it off. Okay, fine. So, Omlan Thor, who was in my lab, now is in Calcutta somewhere. He the, developed a method to measure the in vivo supercoiling of the chromosomal DNA in bacteria. And as you can see, uh, part of the chromosomal segment is shown there on the top line as well, open reading frame and genes and their corresponding promoters. And he devised a method using sorolin binding to DNA in vivo to determine the supercoilical density of the E. coli chromosome. Part of it is shown here. And it shows that the superhelical density is not uniform all over the chromosome. As the red line, his data shows that the peaks of the red line show the regions of negative superhelicity. The valleys are the regions of positive superhelical density. And some intermediate arbitrary region are the regions of relaxed DNA, which is rare, but there are, exist. Okay. The reason we did that to show for the first time that the a gene located, for example, somewhere here. Can you see my cursor? No. Okay, no? Not yet. I don't know. No, not right now. In yeah. this region, it can you see? It is visible here only, yes. Oh, I see. Well, some of the Promoter regions of the genes shown here are located in the peak of red carbs, which means heavily supercoiled DNA. And because that gene promoter needs highly supercoiled DNA to be transcribed, if you take the promoter out from that region and put it in a region where DNA supercoiled is positive, the promoter is turned off no matter whatever you do to sell. Okay, so there is a position effect. The structure of the chromosome has an influence on gene expression. That was our first clue that we should worry about the chromosomal DNA structure that influences gene expression. And that's the line, that's the line that shows that the amount of supercoiling when it's relaxed. When the red cap touches the blue line, that means the supercoiling density is zero, means is relaxed. Now we'll talk about HU protein. The HU is a protein binding protein. There are lots of them. There are about 40,000 molecules per cell. It's a dimer of two homologous subunits, alpha and beta. Each has a 9KD size. HU is most abundant occupant of the chromosome by chip chip assay. We showed by chip chip assay that I would not about to go to any kind of techniques here. 
that almost all of the chromosomal malaria is occupied the protein H2. Now the chromosome shape, Nancy Kleckner and Bob Fisher has shown that by electron microscopy, that the chromosomal, chromosome E. coli cell shown in gray has a twisted helical ellipsoid form and its central path is shown indicated in black. So we wanted to see how the DNA is shaped inside by doing a thin section microscopy who in virtual case is called tomography. We labeled HU with M. cherry, which is a fluorescent marker and did the chromosome observed by tomography. And you can see that you can go cross section or vertical or longitudinal section. You see the DNA, which is colored here, red by red cherry is because of HU binding is uh, condensed in the center away from the- I that that good to see you. So the point is that DNA is fully covered with HU as we found with by chip chip assay. Now all DNA binding proteins in bacteria or any living kingdom has two kinds of binding affinities to DNA. A specific sequence specific binding that goes to a specific binding site recognizing the sequence and does what it does. But all DNA binding protein has also some low level DNA uh, non-specific affinities. H being a DNA binding protein has all the same thing. It shows two DNA binding affinities, high affinity structure specific, not sequence specific H U binds with high affinity to distorted DNA. I'll deal with that later with about nanomolar affinity. H U also shows like other DNA binding proteins a low affinity binding to sequence non-specific random DNA bind anywhere and it is thousand or less micromolar affinity. So in the literature, all the DNA, uh, specific DNA binding proteins have a function and people completely ignore these non-binding low affinity activity. We are going to emphasize, most of my talk will be devoted this low affinity binding of HU to non-specific random DNA. We did now high affinity binding of HU to distorted band DNA, cruciform DNA and so on has three functions known functions. One, it regulates gene expression. Second, it participates in site-specific recombination. Also, it helps in E. coli initiation replication. On the left panel shows the structure of um, HU controlling gene expression in the galloper. HU binds, as seen shown in the blue, to a region which is so-called bent, quote-unquote, bent DNA which brings the two arms of the DNA close to each other so that another protein, which contacts two segments of the DNA at the same time, giving rise to a DNA loop, which allows, which turns up the promoter, polymerase can bind there, but cannot get out of this, it's called lockdown. On the right is amplified, we determine the structure of HU dimer bind to the bent DNA. Now, HU, like you mentioned, are two di uh, is a dimer. Each subunit has a beta extended beta, beta helix, you can see beta uh, loop, which enters the major group. And with the presence of a proline 63 in that area, it makes a contact with the DNA. And you can see the DNA structure, DNA of HU complex. I'm no, noteworthy here is that the DNA helix is perpendicular to the X of the HU, okay? And let me mention one important point. There are approximately 200 estimated specific binding sites of HU for the chromosomal E. coli chromosome. But you can notice that there are, only there are 40,000 molecules of HU per cell. Why so much excess? It's because HU is the most abundant occupant of the nucleoid. It binds to nucleoid many places and that's the another role of HU, which we'll discuss further. Now, we determine the various HU DNA complexes. Top is the shown, I already discussed the structure of HU to a bent DNA, shown on the right, and with the within, within the beta loop, where the DNA is perpendicular to the HU axis. We also determine with the help of a great structural biochemist, biologist, Michael Hamel, who helped us to determine the structure of HU to non-specific DNA. 
point to your 19 base pair DNA fragment and mixed with HE at higher concentration because this is not binding specificity and showed, came up with this exocrystal structure of HU bound to not specifically to DNA. As you can see, that each subunit of HU has three lysine residues exposed, which enters the phosphate groups in the DNA and makes a contact. And there is a potential, as, as, as I'll show, that the other subunit also has three lysine, can bind another DNA on the other side. Noteworthy is that in this case, compared to, in contrast to the strict binding, HU, the DNA helix is parallel to the HU helix. So we conclude that random to DNA binding mode is different from structure-specific binding mode. And we're the first one to crystallize a non-specific DNA protein complex. The implication is that random HU binding is biologically important. That's what we're going to discuss further. Now, uh, Michal Hamel also did a very informative experiment. He did some, I'm sorry, my screen is, Okay, I can't show my, because the picture's coming up once in a while. Okay, so he took an 80 base pair of random DNA of random sequence and mixed with the proper ratio of HU to DNA and did the all angle excess scattering study solutions. Showed that the spectrum, the, uh, the, uh, the success spectrum is on the right, is that is a monotonous carb, doesn't have any special feature, if it's only DNA or is only protein shown in blue and the DNA is in black. But the, when you mix the DNA and HU in proper ratio, he gets several diffraction peaks, as you can see in the middle. There are different concentrations used for different carbs. The major conclusion is that the diffraction peak reflects the distance between two HU molecules on the shown on the left. You see different peaks which signify that HU is located on the DNA at a fixed distance from each other, and the random binding helps multimerization of HU on DNA, both lateral and medial directions, that is in parallel and up and down. This other thing provides that I mentioned that HU non specific binding. It binds through the lysine exposed on one subunit and one DNA. The other subunit, I wish I had this, uh, can also bind to another DNA molecule. Therefore, HU, polymeric property of HU is that it bundles DNA, picks up several DNA molecules at the same time. And we are proposing this random binding provides scaffolds and shapes to the nuclear structure. Now I wanted to know the localization, confirm the localization of HU in DNA, in the chromosomal DNA. These are live in vivo experiments. We label as before HU with them cherry and look at them live cells. We did the growing cells. Most of the cells we observe under microscope are dividing cells. As you can see on the left top, the location of HU by fluorescence. The, I cannot show, but the size of the E. coli cell. This is a composite picture of thousands of cells. Uh, the, the black line was there. You cannot see it here in this slide, but HU is condensed into two sides because they are dividing nucleoids. Below is the um, stain properties of DNA by hex dye, which can detect DNA. I should have used a different color, but you can see the DNA location inside the cell, the two nucleoid again, are coincides to the location of the HU. And you don't see much free HU moving around the cell volume in the cytosolic area. Uh, that's a surprise why the new proteins with low affinity proteins are located within the nucleoid and doesn't float around when it's dissociated. Now, this binding is because of non-specific binding. All HU are located in the DNA because when you use it in the shown in the middle, a, the three triple lysine mutated to alanine, the uh, HU as shown biochemically, not shown here, loses its not specific DNA binding. In that case, in the picture below, show that HU now can diffuse out of the nuclear area and occupying the whole cell. That means the non-specific binding of HU is, was responsible to 
keep them within the nucleoid area. In this mutant, however, DNA as shown below is still in the central area, doesn't diffuse out with HU. On the right is shown the picture of specific binding protein mutant to alanine, which binds to specifically to about 200 sites. And you can see not much difference. They're still in the nucleoid area with the DNA. So conclusion is that random binding of HU to DNA keeps most HU in the nuclear, not in the cytosol. Why? Why? There's no nuclear membrane in bacteria that why is studying, uh, why is in the nuclear area restricted, doesn't diffuse out. This is we bought a more extensive microscope and a movie camera. We followed single depth molecule dynamics of HU in this cell. Here is a magnification, the white gray area is the entire cell. And some examples of single molecule of HU are shown by the wiggly lines in the middle. There are three kinds of HU, we can follow their movements. The red line, which is longer, so they represent fast moving HU, which is about 0.4 micrometer per second. The blue lines, wiggly lines, are rapid moving, uh, sorry, slow moving part of uh, HU molecules, single molecules which have about 0.14 micrometer per second. Now, there's a third kind of molecule, so I hope you can see the rainbow colored. That means those are in transitions, a fast moving molecule suddenly becomes a slow moving molecules or vice versa, a slow moving molecule suddenly becomes fast moving molecules. We believe those are, we, we we, HU with rapid motion, we think are free molecules moving around away from the DNA. And those with limited motion are DNA bound. They cannot move around, but the little motion they have is because of the DNA itself vibrates and moves a little bit. And, and the, sometimes these HU molecules get dissociated and reassociated with rapid kinetics. Now, notice here is that all HU are in the nucleoid area the surrounding area, which is mostly cytosolic, are free from HU. Now, we did a lot of observation and collected some numbers, and I'll not go through the details, but mention, summarize. On the left is shown the wild type situation, where you see about, about half of the molecules are in unbound state, shown in red, and half of the molecules, about 43%, are bound state, means slow moving. Now, measuring the rainbow particles in the sense that they're free, changing their status from bound to unbound, we found out the, 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 the binding rate, the uh, bound to, uh, sorry, unbound to bound state is very fast kinetics, about 10 per second. Similarly, the bound state becomes unbound state, that is dissociation is also about four, a very fast 14 per second. Now, in the middle, we have used the, the same experiment using the trilysine mutant, which are converted to alanine, which loses biochemically its no specific binding affinity. You can see most of the molecules are unbound and are free moving around all over the cell in the cytosolic area, very little in bound state. Mostly, there's a specific binding. As you can see, the, the on rate that is Bound, unbound to bound is only one per second, tenfold less, and the bound to unbound is still 10 per second. On the right is shown the proline mutant, which loses specific mining. That doesn't change the picture much at all, say about 50 50 or so, 70 30 approximately. We made several conclusions. We have we have shown HU have two diffusive states with rapid kinetics, DNA bound or unbound. Bound state are because of non-specific binding. Non-specific HU binding to DNA keeps HU within the nucleoid, although there is no nuclear membrane. That's one mechanism that you can have an organelle in a cell without any membrane. It's just you play around, nature has played around the um, physical parameters of the DNA binding protein. Now we switch to describe some of the non-coding RNA that we discovered a few years ago that are involved, we believe, in DNA condensation and structural rearrangement. Now, I'll show in the next slide uh, shown here is that the E. coli chromosome, all bacterial chromosomes, some elements of DNA sequence, small regions of DNA sequence all over the scattered all over the chromosome, they're called wrap elements. And they don't code for any gene or protein. 
anything. All of these, uh, many of these rape elements control, uh, make some transcarbon to some RNA molecules. Okay, and one of them, the rape elements called rep 325 is transcarbon into an RNA that we found is called the NARNA4, whose potential secondary start secondary structure is shown below the sequence. It has it is about 100 nucleotide long. It has two stem and loop structure, but each stem has a bubble or uh, or open openness on, on without hydrogen bonds, and that's very important. We'll come back to that. All these RNA we discovered ten of them. One is we have studied in detail in RNA4 binds to HU. As shown on the right, you take a label uh, RNA and you do an electrophoretic mobility test at different concentration of HU shown in the button and you can see the mobility is retarded because protein binds to HU binds to RNA. Our hypothesis that this non-coding RNAs are involved in DNA compaction, that's our hypothesis. Now, I mentioned the, the DNA rep elements. E. coli chromosome has many such things distributed all over the chromosome shown in red on the left panel. And you can see they're distributed all, all over. I should say many of these rep elements has diatomity palindromic sequences. Therefore, in supercoiled state, they form cruciform structure. Nancy Kleckner and Job Decker has devised a uh, technique called 3C assay, 3C experiments, where you can show, I will not go to the details, show that two regions of the chromosome, distal region of the chromosome, can contact each other. The 3C experiment can capture that contact and identify the sequence, which region is, um, sorry, I don't have the cursor working. Um, can contact. We, they develop this in yeast and uses this in mammalian chromosome. We have done the 3C experiments in bacteria and E. coli and shown on the right we found some of these rep elements can contact each other as shown by straight line. That means the, the ignore the number, the catalog numbers of the rep elements. Um, for example, on the right Element number 153 can interact with element number eight, uh, element nine by physical contact. And we have shown some examples. Okay, so, so we, this demonstrate that some rep elements in the form of cruciform, I know they're cruciform because DNA is supercall and their palindromic sequence are connected in space. Now, when a fixed region of the chromosome, fixed segment interacts with another segment distally located, we call that chromosome folding. I hope that's clear. It's not, not everything interacts with everything. That would be a mess that don't, many of them don't interact at all. And some, some of them do interact with specific sequence on the other side, okay? And some examples are there. So we think they are involved in chromosome folding. The connection, by the way, the most important thing that all these connections go away or is reduced drastically if HU is mutated in the cell. If the cell doesn't have HU or non-coding RNA number four, then the contact becomes extremely low or non-existent. So we have shown that these DNA-DNA interaction of two palindromic sequences, that is cruciform sequence, with the help of RNA contact each other, we have shown that in vitro confirm that in vitro. We label the RNA with Psi 5 fluorescence and also label the a single molecule cruciform DNA with 6 FAM, a fluorescent of a different intensity, and mix them together in the presence of uh, styrene beads, magnetic beads. And the bead is coated with antibody, which is binds to RNA DNA hybrid. The bead has RNA DNA hybrid antibody coated with it. And it it finds an RNA DNA hybrid molecule, it captures it. And we can locate that capture by, uh, by fluorescence microscope. As, at the top line, it shows the beads alone. There is, you don't see any color, neither of Psi 3 nor of 6 fam, that is RNA or DNA. If you mix with the beads with um, cruciform DNA, you still don't see any color in the beads. If you mix with RNA, you still don't see any color within the, within the beads, 
But if you add cruciform DNA and RNA both to the beaks, you can see the beaks, some of the beads have picked up colors. You can see both RNA color is side three on the red and DNA color is six by in green. And the overlap map on the extreme right is shown that the in the bead, the both RNA and DNA look in the same, giving the yellow overlap color. That means it forms a DNA RNA complex. We have done this in sample results, a lot of them and collected some numbers. These are summarized in this slide, that is DNA RNA connections in vitro. On the left top in bluish, light bluish, shown the DNA that we use in this experiment. This is a palindromic sequence, dire symmetry, which in, uh, in, in supercoiled state forms a cruciform structure, which is shown on the right, and the RNA Label side three is the same RNA we used, uh, I showed you before with two stem and loop structure, each one carrying a bubble. Now the data on the, is the, the table. When the beads are mixed with both cruciform DNA and RNA, 5% of the beads are shown, uh, shown mixed color, never show single color, always show mixed color. And that's in the absence of HU. If you add HU in the mixture, you can clearly see the number of percentage of beads which having capturing color is much high, 30%. That means the RNA and DNA interact with each other, presumably by some kind of hydrogen bond because it is captured by RNA-DNA hybrid antibody. And this binding, that is interaction, HU, RNA-DNA interaction is enhanced by HU. Note what is the second line. When you have an RNA mixed with DNA, where the bubble and cruciform, uh, sorry, bubble and bulges and loops are flattened by complete hydrogen bonding, straight, flat RNA, then you don't see any kind of uh, RNA DNA hybrid formation. Similarly, if you use a DNA, not the cruciform DNA, but straight DNA, random sequence, you don't see any kind of RNA DNA complex formation also suggesting the importance of the, is the loops and bulges that are recognized between the RNA and DNA. So we have a cartoon model that two DNA molecules represented by green uh, uh, sphere, no, what do you call it, ellipsoid, and one RNA, two DNA segments in the form cruciform are brought together by NR, NARNA with a stem and loop structure and they're joined together and somehow we don't know HU catalyzes that, that uh, complex formation. So we're thinking that these RNA and DNA which are interacting with each other do not have extensive homology. Okay, all the sequences are critical but many of them you can find in cell lots of these are RNA molecules shown have these bubbles and loop structure. This is a non-coding non RNA. And you frequently find microhomology, which are usually in the, in the exposed area. So a, a, for example, a, a bulge in an RNA molecule have non-paired base pairs, and these base pairs chemically flip out the base and available for bond formation with a, another base pair in another molecule, which also flipped out by showing that two bulges or one loop, one bulges can form hydrogen bonds if they are complementary. Okay, these normally is not predicted. Now, if your, your physical chemistry teacher would tell you to have a RNA-DNA stable hybrid to be detectable as to have a 10 to 12 nucleotides long by base pairing. We don't have that. We believe that, we really strongly believe that two to six nucleotides long exposed patches are hungry for bond formation and they can find another partner with some hydrogen bonding. They can pair them either between loop and loop or between bulge and bulge or bulge and loop and various forms between two different RNA molecules or in this case shown in the next slide uh, between DNA and RNA molecule. If there is a complementarity available in the looped or bulge region that's called kissing. kissing uh, uh, structures are proposed between loops are proposed by Tomizawa a long time ago in connection with DNA replication of plasmids and we're borrowing that idea. There was no physical evidence really for this kissing structure except recently, only two months ago, the paper appeared from 
Chinoco, he showed RNA and RNA can pair uh, by loop permission by mass spectral, uh, sorry, by, by, by NMR analysis. And we are following that. So I'll show you the slides quickly. We don't have good, uh, authentic uh, uh, final results yet that we tested that one way. We're going to test that one way, the kissing loops is that you take an RNA, which is labeled fluorescein, which is a fluorescent marker, and mixed with a DNA with a similar structure, which is labeled with rhodamine. And you can see in the two loop region, shaded yellow, there's a complementary base pair available for pairing. Now we shine this mixture with, uh, at, a, at a wavelength which recognizes fluorescein, that is RNA, and you see in below shown is the spectrum, which is blue in color only, and you see fluorescence, fluor fluorescein map, okay? And you mix with DNA, you see some spectra available at the rhodamine. We don't shine the rhodamine, when energy is transferred from fluorescein to rhodamine, you see a peak around 575 nanometer. Okay, on the right is shown the same results except that we add a HU, the rhodamine peak increases, suggesting there is a signal that these three things get together when energy is transferred, they have to uh, be close to each other, presumably by hydrogen bonding. And if you add HU, you get more enhanced signals. These are some data we're collecting. We need to make more controls and so on. And um, so another way we're testing the RNA-DNA kissing interactions between using tethered particle motion, TPM acid. We have designed about 500 base pair long DNA shown in the black at the top. In the middle of these areas here and there, we attach an an RNA molecule shown in blue, the hairpin structure, which is hydrogen bonded to the DNA by some engineering. And if it's a little farther apart, is also we bind a DNA molecule to the basic DNA by similar hydrogen bonding in a cartoon form. And we measure the distance by TPM analysis from end to end of the DNA, which is about 500 base pair. But if the two molecules of RNA and DNA bound to the long DNA, can interact with each other by some mechanism. The, the DNA has to bend and give a distance D2, which would be smaller. We can follow the motion shown by cartoon, the TPM analysis, that the one end of the long DNA is um, tethered to the, to the microscope, um, the base of the microscope by, by biotin, and the other end is with, this, uh, with a, a bead. And you can measure the distance of the bead at different times on the floor of the base of the, of the grid, okay? And if there is an interaction between the two little cartoons, DNA and RNA, red and blue, if they interact with each other, the length of the base, the length of the bead from the base would decrease. So you get a, if you keep measuring them in real life motion, you can see in vitro a change in distance from uh, one distance D1 to D2 and give a telegraphic signal. In real life, you get this kind of signals. You get a lot of signals. You can average and you see up and down uh, things and change in distance. From the change in distance, you can calculate lots of energy and interaction and so on. And with proper mutant control, which cannot be spared, we have negative results. And we do not have the full, it's a huge number of extents. We don't have full results. So I can tell you more about this. So the advertised part of the talk is that this is the 3D structure of the chromosome. That's the last part. I will take five more minutes. We are using GPS trilateration mechanism to analyze the 3D structure of the chromosome. We are all familiar with them. There are three satellites at the top of the earth, shown on the left corner, uh, left corner up there, the three satellites, which have a fixed distance from each other. And this satellite can locate you or your cell phone or your automobile somewhere in the planet, and you can determine the, the uh, distance. I mean, you are all shown in yellow, and if you measure the distance of one object, say your car roaming somewhere, and you can get the XYZ coordinates. This is simple solid geometry that you can get XYZ coordinates from the three satellites. 
the point Y, we are using the same cytotogen chromosome. We label the chromosome in three different parts with a red fluorescence just for chemistry sake. And if the chromosome, circular chromosome, is condensed inside the cell, shown on the left, within the green, green is the cell wall. And if the structure of the chromosome, condensed chromosome, is, has a fixed structure, 3D fixed structure, you can measure the three distance easily between the three so-called satellite markers. If you can do that, already suggest chromosome is not moving around, they are fixed in space, those three alleles. Now, you can mark the chromosome any place you want with another fluorescence shown here in green somewhere. You can do lots of them and measure the X, Y, Z coordinates of that new spot in the cell using the, the distance of the three satellite spots. And this is the kind of pictures you get. They're shown on the single cell example. We have about three red spots in one single cell. Let's look at the bottom the three red spots. And you can see a green spot. In the over, over the overlapped image, you can see four spots. You can measure the distance from each other and come to the XYZ coordinates inside the cell space of a given portion of the gene or spot in the gene. We are collecting a lot of data. There's a lot of pictures, a lot of my measurements and so on. It's kind of boring, but I'll tell you our approach. We, we believe we're in the right path. We, I'm going to show you data to show the distance between two, a pair of markers on the chromosome, for example, between A and D, or between D and B, or between D and C. Examples are shown between D and B for here. On the left is lots of cells. Each cell has a green fluorescence area reflecting the location of D. In the middle, you see the location of A in different cells as reflected by green color in each cell. You massage the data with some computer software and you take the densest area of each spot and make it sharper. And then you can measure the distance between them, as you can see on the right, there are lots of cells with a green spot and a red spot, and you can measure the distance easily. Of course, the distance varies as you measure because they're live cells, and the kind of data you get here. I show here the same distance between D and B first in the middle top panel. We do a bar graph and show the probability occupation. And so the, most of the time, the distance between D and B is, is reflected the peak, and that's about 233 nanometer. You can see that if when you measure D and C labeling them, you can see the distance is between 306 nanometer is different. So between DNA and so on and so on, we can measure this. And so if you keep measuring about 50 of them, we can conclude, and their fixed distance with some variations, we can conclude, yes, each gene segment is located in the fixed position inside the cell in, on the chromosome. Now, interesting thing, that's the last slide of my talk, is that data slide, is that we're talking here is shown the results, detailed results of the distance between A and D, for example, shown in the left. And the blue curve on the right shows the distance peak, that is the about 323 nanometer distance with a variation of four plus minus four nanometer. However, we measure the same distance between the two markers, A and D, in a strain which is deleted for the protein HU, which we propose help organization of the 3D structure of the chromosome. The distance shown in the purple curve, purple, I think, pink curve, that the distance changes. The distance increase to from 323 to 358 nanometer is much larger change than the error variation. And therefore we believe that the distance between genes are fixed so far, and we have to do lots of experiments to confirm that. And the distance changes, the epsom say means the organization and 3D structure is influenced by presence of a tube. Um, I think that's all I want to say. Uh, let me see. I, since I, at the beginning, I told you we have a final structure. We do not have a final structure. I don't know whether our hypothesis is true or not. Our quest, however, we find some 
if you want to know the structure, we are right or not, you have to come back, uh, give us some five years. I'll still be waiting here in front of my computer and it will tell you whether we are right or wrong. But during our quest to do determine the thesis structure, we came out with several concepts, which I must mention here. One thing we found out, the importance of non-specific protein binding to DNA in biology. Usually for specific binding protein, these are all ignored, sequence specific binding. Here we show there's a biological value that it, it helps a major, it, it does a major performance in the sense it helps, uh, HU helps, HU is not, not specific binding helps DNA structural organization in the chromosome. Second little concept is that the we have found a mechanism, these physical properties of protein that can make an organelle stay intact without a membrane. The HU, because of low affinity binding and rapid binding kinetics and dissociation of HU to DNA. And we have shown interactions between nucleic acid by kissing of loops and bulges. These results are incomplete. We do need a control enough and we think we have enough evidence to suggest to pursue it further. And finally, we believe gene locations in chromosome may be fixed in 3D space of cells, which affect gene expression. If it's located in a wrong orientation, wrong position in the cell, the gene is either on to off or off to on. And I think that's all mostly what I want to say today, except I have not said the most important thing of our work, and that is shown the last slide and that's the people who are associated with being the lab, the current occupants of the lab are shown here. Uh, of them, I should mention um, Shubhash Parma, who did many of the biochemical uh, assays in the work and fluorescence studies, and also uh, Xianning Wang. He, she did the, all the three-dimensional structural work, is still continuing. And I should mention Amblan Thar, one of the former students, postdocs, he is now at um, what is called IIIT, it stands I believe for International Institute of Information Technology in Calcutta, Newtown. And on the right, I have listed my collaborators. I'm proud to be associated with them. I have also mentioned my Michal Hamel, who did a super structural biologist. He helped us with lots of structural work. I described some of them. Victor Zurkin at NCI, who we argue with all the time, is a fun to discuss science and argue with them, right or wrong, about DNA mechanics. Don Court, I didn't mention anything about, is a fake geneticist, is my uh, lifelong collaborator. Kim Snappen, he's a mathematician at the Niels Bohr Institute of Theoretical, uh, Theoretical Physics in Copenhagen. And when we propose a model and find a wild model, we send him the idea and he checks it out, calculates, and he gives his blessing or uh, curse to see the model is math uh, mathematically acceptable or not. And Zhe Xiao, where uh, Wang does our single cell fluorescent experiments. Thank you.